Welcome to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's DIFF, the interactive online event series that aims to shift mindset and inspire action towards a circular economy. All through the week, we'll be sharing and exploring disruptive ideas across a range of topics. Today in this session, we will hear from three reuse entrepreneur stories that are transforming Indonesia's plastic crisis. My name is Clemence Golinelli and I will be your host. I'm delighted to also introduce Sandrine from Odike from NVU, who will be facilitating this session. I will invite Sandrine to kick things off really shortly, but first let me remind you that this is an interactive event, so please do share any thoughts, comments, or questions in the comment box next to the video or on Twitter by using the hashtag thinkdiff. So without further ado, Sandrine, the first question is for you. Can you tell us a bit more about NVU and the Zero Waste Living Lab? Hello, everyone. Hello, Clemence. Thank you very much for introducing me. It's a great pleasure to be hosting today's uh, Think Diff session on tackling Indonesia's plastic crisis. My name is Sandrine van Odijk. Uh, I am with an organization called NVU. And at NVU, we are building world-changing companies. We are a social venture building studio, which basically means that we are setting up new business models and new ventures that tackle some of the world's most complex issues. Starting off from system errors in, in the market, uh, we develop enterprises that ultimately deliver high impact. Uh, we do this from our offices in Kenya, India, Chile, Indonesia, and the Netherlands. And at the moment, and this is what I will be talking about as well today in this session, uh, we, are, we are working on uh, the Zero Waste Living Lab, which creates scalable and world-changing social ventures to stop the plastic ocean crisis. And that's very necessary because actually every minute a truckload of plastic is entering our oceans. And that's a fact that is very difficult for all of us to to imagine, um, but it's definitely something that we want to change. And then if you think about what's going to happen in the, in the near future, it's that this crisis is only going to get a lot, a lot worse uh, with the global packaging production quadrupling up into 2050 and growing thereafter. And um, we cannot really recycle our way out of this crisis. We really have to find a way to reduce and uh, reduce the total volume of packaging that is put out on the market. So that is what we're trying to do in the Zero Waste Living Lab. It's a, it's a venture building program that we run in Indonesia, which aims to be a global showcase that shows how you can actually reduce single use plastics. We do this in two places in, on Java, um, but we expect this impact to grow uh, way beyond Java and beyond Indonesia actually as a whole. Uh, totally, we want to reach uh, at least 20,000 tons of plastic packaging avoided, uh, but also really create a market uh, for zero waste products and services that allow everybody to, in an affordable and convenient way, have access to, uh, to products without creating this pollution. So radically reducing also the global um, marine litter. What we actually do in the program is that we follow three approaches where we build a portfolio of businesses and uh, social enterprises that start solving this, this issue of uh, single use plastic. Uh, we, first of all, team up with some local entrepreneurs that are already doing really awesome stuff on the ground. Uh, we will hear one of those entrepreneurs, Casey Peer, with uh, Tancho representing Casey Peer later today. Um, then the second approach is that we replicate successful models from other geographies. We replicate them to Indonesia. We will also hear one of these cases today. And we are ideating new business models and validating them locally in the market. Um, and another case of that comes up as well. The cumulative impact of all of this is really amazing. <laughs> it is uh, exponential, meaning that, you know, we're setting up ventures that are self-sustaining on their own once they're up and running. So we get them to a point where they're investment ready, where capital can be attracted and they can continue to grow. Um, they continue to grow as a business, but then uh, at the same time also continue to grow their impact. And um, 
that is what you see here in this graph. Uh, right now we have about five vendors in our pipeline and we are building at least two to four more uh, in the coming two years. So stay tuned for a lot more of these uh, really impactful impact ventures. I'm um, extremely excited about this webinar today because we have three of, of the reuse ventures that are in the Zero Waste Living Lab program. We have them with us today. Um, the first one being Tancho, he is tuning in from Indonesia and going to tell us more about Casey Peer. Then we have Anna and Adam, both also from different locations. Anna is in Brussels, Adam is in the UK, tuning in to talk about Zero Waste Warung. And Hana is currently in Hong Kong and will talk about Muse. So in a very brief moment, I will introduce you to uh, our first speaker. So I would like to welcome to the virtual stage, um, Tancho Bangung. He is the CEO and founder of KCPR. KCPR is a farm to fork business in Indonesia. And it's basically uh, a platform that, oh, sorry, I actually am not supposed to talk all about KCPR right now because of course Tancho will do that. I just wanted to introduce him. Uh, Tancho, you guys started as a, a farm to fork platform. And um, right now you're you're really shifting gears and making it fully circular and without any packaging. And as we can see here on the picture of the supermarket, the supermarket is full of packaging uh, and especially single use plastic packaging in uh, to to wrap fruits and uh, vegetables. So Tanjo, my first question to you is uh, whether you can take our audience, who is our audience might be all over the world, right? Can you take them to Indonesia and to um, uh, that they imagine that they live in Jakarta? How does this work for them? What um, how, can you tell a little bit more about KCPR and what services it delivers? Uh, Sandrin, for having me. Uh, yeah, uh, KCPR is uh, first we based on the uh try to help the farmers to get more sustainable by doing their production but more and more to our uh development we saw that uh it's not only uh, sustainability in the production that matter but also the uh, management of the waste so uh we try to find a way out to the uh, our consumers, but then we found out we can do it from the production as well. So we try to, uh, mainly the plastic wrap is used to keep the uh, vegetable fresh, but uh, is we try to find a way to uh, eliminate all the plastic wrap by using, a, develop some techniques to keep the the freshness of the vegetable without uh, plastic wrap. So uh, of course, uh, first uh, there's a challenges uh, by the farmers, but now well, once we uh, starting to use uh, to use zero uh, plastic in our uh, business process. All the farmers uh, get uh, economically, they saving a lot from this uh, uh, plastic spending. Not because of the uh, cost of the plastic itself. Uh, plastic, we know that is cheap, but the uh, cost of the labor. So uh, this is a win-win solution for the farmers. They get uh, cost saving, but for the consumer, they're quite happy because uh, they have a fresh produce and without plastics. And we just a uh, few weeks uh, implementing this uh, solution and we confidence that uh, the market is uh, responding positive and uh, farmers is happy and we are super happy in the middle. I think that's... Uh, uh, short uh, conclusion for this. That's great, Tancho. I'm really, really excited to hear that. 
I'm just also showing some of the pictures from uh, the app that you have developed, but that is the base of the platform, right? So KCPR in that sense yeah. connects the organic farmers with the consumers. They can order their fruits and vegetables the day before they want it. It gets freshly harvested and then the consumer gets it the next day in this fully circular method, right? Without any single use plastic. And that's what we see an example of here, right? It's delivered in a reusable crate, uh, in uh, reusable cloths to also keep the fruits and vegetables as fresh as possible so that we also eliminate food waste at the same time. Yeah, all right. Uh, the challenges is mostly uh, how to set up uh, distribution, uh, fully circular distribution process. And we learn for, yeah, Kajipir now is uh, in our fourth year. Uh, and so it's a lot of things we try and a lot of uh, fail failure, but uh, at last uh, we think we tr uh, find a good solution for this. And I think uh, next year will be a good time for us to scaling up. Uh, the, the problem for the distribution, uh, I think it will be uh, a general uh, problem uh, amongst the rural area. If, as we know, in the urban area, there's a lot of uh, solution for logistic, like uh, crowdsource logistic. Now in Southeast Asia with uh, Gojek and, and Grab, but there's no solution for uh, uh, cross-source uh, logistic in urban area. Uh, sorry, in rural area. So this is quite important that we uh, can um, validate the solution. And of course, with uh, the solution, we have to uh, reach out to many uh, possible partners, uh, uh, other private companies, uh, funders, and the government. And uh, we can uh, bring together all the resources to develop more circular uh, base uh, uh, distribution. And hopefully, uh, it can contribute a solution for the uh, minimize or zeroing the plastic waste. Great, Tancho. That was really great to hear from you. Um, I'm going to now stop share so we can prepare for the, the next speaker. Uh, Tancho, wish you great luck uh, with the scaling up and making your, your uh, operations as, as circular as possible, eliminating uh, a lot of tons of single-use plastic. So I would thank you. I would now like to switch to our next reuse case that is on the line today with us. Uh, that's called the Zero Waste Warum. With us are Adam Andrews. Uh, he's an innovator from the UK uh, and my colleague Anne Pogenpol. And together they have developed the Zero Waste Warum, which is basically a, a refill business uh, for uh, Warum, which are small mom and pop shops, uh, to replace single use sachets. And those are some of the most difficult packagings to tackle. So I'm really excited to have them here with me today. I'm going to uh, briefly switch uh, back to the screen. Yes. So that I can show you also a picture of how a warung looks like. And now I would like to pose my first question to Adam. And that is, Adam, can you take us as audience to uh, a, warung, a warung store and tell me how, and tell us how you are going to tackle single use plastic packaging? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. So, um, as you say, um, Sandrine, I think a mom and pop shop is a good description for a um, a barung store. So, um, essentially, uh, they're a neighborhood convenience store or a corner shop that sells um, the sort of the daily needs that people in their neighborhood or community need. Um, but <clears throat> I'd say culturally, they're more important than that. They're also a um, a meeting place uh, for people. Um, and they're an important part of uh, their neighborhood's community. Um, and also as a business concept, um, they represent an opportunity for uh, families to use their 
entrepreneurial skills to um, uh, supplement their income. So as you say, they're mom and pop shops. Um, they often operate um, uh, out of the back of a family's home and uh, often run by women. Um, and uh, as you can see from that um, picture there. Um, and in terms of, of scale, it's they're difficult to estimate how many of their barung stores there are as it's quite an informal business uh, and not registered. So uh, some estimates, estimates put it at uh, there's about 2.5 million of, of these uh, stores uh, in Indonesia. Um, and as you can see from the picture, much of what is sold at a Varung store is, uh, is sachets um, and, uh, you know, such as uh, shampoo, liquid detergent, instant coffee, things like that. Um, and uh, the most common format is a, is a 50 milliliter size. So quite, quite small, single use, single portion um, products. Um, and if, you, we, if we just sort of focus in on detergent as one, as one product line, um, it's estimated that 70% of detergent sold in Indonesia is in these small um, sachet formats. Um, and then to kind of put that into uh, numbers, although it's still, still hard to comprehend the scale of it, but um, it's estimated that 38 million, just in detergent, 38 million uh, sachets are sold a day in Indonesia. And that's about 76 tons a day of, uh, of, of packaging waste. Um, so it's quite, quite a huge, uh, huge scale um, that's happening. Um, so at Zero Waste Varung, um, we've developed a, a new blockchain inspired business model. Uh, and it, uh, it incentivizes the uh, adoption and reuse of a refillable sachet, which you can see on, this, on the screen there. Um, so there's three, three main components to, um, to the business. One is uh, a large um, branded bottle of detergent, um, if we're staying with the detergent example. Um, so large multi-liter bottle of, of detergent. Um, the second component of the, of the system is these um, small refillable sachets uh, that as you can see, they have a, a cap on them and they open up at the top to make it uh, easy for the, the Varung to, to fill um, and then a cap to allow uh, portion control uh, by, the, by the customer. And then the third component is, um, is an app as well. So how it will work uh, or how it works is that um, the Varung store owner, um, as opposed to buying uh, boxes and boxes of these um, uh, single portion uh, plastic sachets, they'll buy a uh, large bottle of product um, and, and then they'll, they'll register the purchase of that product on their app. Um, and, and then when a customer comes to purchase um, their 50 milliliters of detergent, um, the Varung owner will uh, fill that refillable sachet. Um, and then also, again, register that sale on the app. Um, and so the app itself also has a, a scanning mechanism built into it to um, add some controls, such as um, uh, making sure the, uh, the large uh, dispenser bottle isn't, isn't tampered with by dilution uh, through water or, or other uh, inferior products. So the, there's controls built into the app to prevent that. Um, and uh, also the, the app also facilitates um, a reward for the customer for um, reusing their sachet. Um, that's that's yep. that's great to hear, Adam. That's a, a sounds like a lovely um, solution and something that's actually much needed for a, a packaging stream that is very difficult to tackle. Um, actually, on that last point, I have a question, and maybe Anna, that's something that you can answer. I'm just going to stop share um, so that people can actually see you. Um, I'm curious because uh, refilling usually seems like more of a hassle, right? You have to take your reusable packaging to the store and you have to get it refilled. So somehow you're finding a way to overcome that barrier. And how can you explain how are you making the customer love this reusable model? Yeah, thanks for, for uh, um, pointing out uh, the convenience that is really crucial to make refill systems work. Uh, and for that, we have been really diving into 
the different customer needs and pain points that they actually experience through the refill and really aiming to overcome that with this uh, zero waste baron concept. And basically, if you look at the consumer, it really creates a value add by having the packaging that actually can be closed again or it can be screwed again. So the precious content actually does not leak directly after cutting it open at the corner. Moreover, actually, um, as Adam mentioned already, um, there is a reward for bringing for reusing the packaging, right? So the more I actually reuse this packaging, the more value it's going to get and uh, the more points and additional um, benefits I, I actually um, gain. Moreover, actually, um, the Warung owner also has benefits from this system because they have an additional margin through the also rewards points that they get for selling the product um, through a refill system. And moreover, actually, they um, have the benefit of using the apps. So these informal stores can really, they, they get an ability to actually manage their business through this app, uh, follow their sales and really track what is going on in the business. And that's a huge value add for them as well. And of course, since, um, since it's app-based, it's also interesting for other stakeholders as we are basically um, collecting data on these um, aspects and that makes it quite valuable as well. And uh, yeah, currently um, we're really building this pilot and we're in conversation uh, with, uh, with brand owners, but also packaging producers to, um, yeah, to make this fly as we have been receiving very positive feedback already from our consumers and uh, people involved. Great. Well, Anna and Adam, that's really a great story. I'm excited that you were able to share this with our audience today. Um, I would like to move on to the next subject because we have not, we don't have endless time, of course, today. Uh, and I want to take you to the third case. It's a, it's a venture that um, uh, Adam. It would be great if you can mute yourself. In the meantime, thank you. So I, I would like to introduce you to Muse. Um, we have Hannah Chung today with us. I'm just going to switch back to put up the, the slides. Um, so Hannah Chung from Muse, formerly known as Revolve, uh, is with us today. I'm very happy to have her join. She's currently in Hong Kong. Um, uh, well, actually, the, the Muse uh, team started on, on Bali, uh, and now you're expanding to, uh, to form a global solution uh, to facilitate multiple use of many different things. Uh, so I'm really curious to hear more, uh, hear more about that. So as, a, as an opening question to you, Hannah, I'm uh, really curious to hear how does Muse change the day of a regular coffee drinker? Thank you so much, Sandrine, and and everyone here for for having us. Um, I'm I am the business development lead, and and uh, I manage the Hong Kong market of Muse. And really, what we're trying to do is uh, provide an automated system for reuse. So, to answer your question of how does it change the day of a regular coffee drinker. It, we aim to not to. Uh, we aim to provide a system that comes close to the convenience of single use, but without the waste. Um, and what does that look like in terms of um, our system? So we provide reusable takeaway containers such as coffee cups and takeaway boxes. We have point of borrow um, station, so then it automates the the, uh, the the checkout process. All of our products will have RFID technology and QR codes for easier tracking to incentivize the the return. And we will have uh, conveniently placed smart return stations as well, so you can drop off that product very much like a recycling bin for it then to be taken, uh, sanitized, and then redistributed back into the system. So it's moving from a linear economy, linear system to a circular economy. That's essentially what we do. Our platform really is a personalized experience where you can uh, see your personal stats of how many cups you've saved. For example, you can there's a map uh, to show you where you can return uh, the cup or takeaway box as well. And um, 
really with our, our whole system, if you think about it, uh, going to your favorite cafe and you ask for a reusable cup, then you put a deposit in. And what that does, uh, as explained on the next slide, is that it incentivizes the, the idea of the borrow and then the return. So not only does it automate this process, but a lot of um, companies are really struggling with, yes, we can provide a lot of reusables, but how do we incentivize that return? So we use a deposit and return model. So what you do is you drop off your used cup or your box into a return station to get that deposit back. And then we collect, sanitize and redistribute back into the system. So in a nutshell, that's essentially what we do. Great, Anna, that, that's, a, that's a great introduction. Um, very helpful for the audience to understand what Muse is doing. Um, so as I said in the introduction, you actually started the company uh, on Bali. Uh, the team of Muse, um, and now you're operating already in three countries. Can you tell us a little bit more about your decision to build a, uh, a global reuse model? Yes, we did. We started our operations originally in Bali and in Indonesia, which is very close to our hearts. Indonesia being the second largest country of mismanaged waste, it, we feel like there is a, a, a large community of people here who want to so, solve these problems with us. So it's been a wonderful opportunity to start here. I am actually currently in Bali with the team um, before I head back to Hong Kong. Um, and the, the whole idea is then to move and, and use this uh, the, the safe space of Bali with encouraging business owners who are desperately looking for these solutions. And um, we are focusing our, our market mainly in Asia, actually, Asia being the largest continent of mismanaged waste. We, we want to focus on these markets. So we are in, uh, in Bali. We are in Hong Kong and Singapore. But we've also, in addition to that, have had many accelerator programs and opportunities to pilot our system. We have a university in the US, uh, uh, Tuck Business School, where we have a tech system running. And we are um, graduates of the Next Gen Cup Challenge, which was sponsored by McDonald's and Starbucks. So with all of these opportunities, it's been a great opportunity, a great, great um, instance for our 16 month journey to really test out all of our verticals. And as you can see here, we, we are focusing on large scale events, which we have saved over 28 thousand cups so far. We're talking to property developers um, and uh, corporate offices to, to build that system within office buildings and commercial buildings. And really where we see it is a cafe to cafe model within a, a whole citywide network. Um, so yeah, to answer your question of why, why are we focusing on, on a global um, scale is because it's a global problem. You know, each year we produce 300 million tons of plastic and that number is only set to grow. So, I mean, we're optimists and we think that we can all solve this problem together and focusing on the reuse really means that we're turning off that plastic tap and we're turning it off now. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, and that only for 16 months, you're, that's what I just hear, hear you say uh, in between uh, 16 months on the way. Um, and um, yeah, as Envy, we're excited to be working together also in the Zero Waste Living Lab to see how we can make Muse work on Java and scale it really across all of Indonesia. Uh, and beyond that, of course, there's opportunities globally for what you're doing, um, as with actually KCP and Zero Waste Warung as well. Uh, so um, yeah, it's been a, a great pleasure to have the three of you here um, in this session now. Um, we're switching to the q and I give, I give back the microphone to Clemence. Uh, so please uh, prepare your questions and we look forward to hear them. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, yes, so we have a lot of questions from the audience coming in. Um, hopefully we'll uh, be able to answer most of them. The first one is from Marcel uh, on the website. He, he says, as a packaging technologist, uh, I am curious to know how you clean your reusable bags and how many times you can reuse it. I guess this is a question for Tantio, but um, anyone can uh, give it a go. 
Uh, I, I think maybe it's nice to hear the perspective from, from Anna and from Hannah on this, uh, both uh, using uh, something that is perhaps in some cases difficult to clean. Um, so uh, would one of you like to give it a go first? Certainly I can go first in terms of what we're doing with reusable takeaway food and beverage. Um, we're focusing on uh, on testing out and, and finding out different materials in which works. Uh, we, we, we've trialed it out with glass, with stainless steel, single walled, double walled. Uh, we're going to explore with plastic as well. So looking at all of these different materials, uh, there is no perfect solution. And in terms of cleaning then, what we're looking for is lightweight and stackable. So with our cleaning partners that are certified they are able then to 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 effectively clean um, so we're essentially uh, developing a product that doesn't currently exist in the fact that we are replicating a single use product but we want it reusable so in that case um, we are we any uh, materials before then we develop on a large scale of a final product Yeah, I guess within the Warum, we have been decided to actually go for a um, for the refill in the store, and which also means that actually the cleaning takes place with the consumer. And uh, as uh, we've mentioned already, it has this uh, scanning mechanism, and that will actually ensure that detergent is only um, refilled within a detergent sachet, and that really ensures um, yeah that uh, that there is no mixing and there is a safety within uh, the packaging that will be reused and uh, in this case actually the cleaning um yeah the cleaning work basically uh, stays with the consumer in this part but maybe we can also have Tancio point out how how they'll do it with the farm to fork business and the reuse bags and the crates of course thank you for the question uh... The box is uh, made from the food grade uh, plastic material. So uh, it can be used uh, and reused uh, quite a long time. And the system that uh, we try to uh, make it uh, clean again is, uh, of course, now we're still using some of the detergent to clean it. But uh, in our uh, supplier, there's uh, one um, supplier that they made uh, organic uh, uh, soap uh, made from plants. And we uh, intend to try to use it as our cleaner as well. So uh, we don't want to, to uh, give a solution to make another problem. So with this kind of uh, um, cleaning material, we hope that uh, not only we can reuse, but the cleaning uh, process will be uh, environmental friendly as well. I hope this is answer the question. Thank you, yes, absolutely. Um, we have another question from Oriol on the website. Um, he asks, how is the social adoption of the project um, do you have any insights? And he also adds that he uh, lived in Indonesia and saw a reuse model with 20 little 20 liter water jugs. Um, and he asks if that makes it easier or not, in your opinion. I don't know. I guess maybe Tantio, you could um, ask that, um, answer that. Thank you. Uh, uh, the reusable uh, system, of course, this is uh, new and uh, we have to introduce and test it and validate it first uh, for a, a small audience or small uh, customers. But uh, interestingly, uh, we saw the growing uh, consciousness and then demand that uh, ask for um, uh, zero waste as well. So uh, when we introduced that, uh, first we uh, minimize the, the plastic uh, with using the reusable crate. Uh, 
uh, the the response is quite positive, and then we step up with uh, uh, zero plastic, and uh, the demand is uh, keep uh, high and is getting stronger, and this is uh, uh, in turn uh, is a positive feedback for us and make us more um, enthusiastic uh, to. Uh, develop this solution more and uh, yeah of course uh, it has to be a, a gradual process but the uh, rapid uh, changing and then the dissemination of the of the uh, solution especially with the social media I think among the many millennial is is growing and spreading very fast. Yeah, and maybe I can add to this actually, since I have been working in Indonesia for yeah. about two years also, it is really exciting to th see this change because when we first started doing our research, really understanding the system and the system errors and where are really packagings that massively leak into the environment and where are the key challenges to overcome this. Um, yeah, we still had to basically explain that plastic packaging is an issue and especially the single use we're talking about in this session. But today, actually, we really see also with the Living Lab that people are demanding these reuse solutions, as Tanshu mentioned also, the, especially the younger generations, the millennials, people are really becoming aware that we actually have to work towards reducing and um, really find new ways of consumption, actually, and how um, yeah, how we can still, of course, keep a convenience within these modes, but really radically reducing the way actually we are using these type of packagings and just, you know, eliminating them completely by finding new ways of consuming. And uh, also to answer to the question about the, the water jugs, I guess there it's interesting because um, also the hospitality sector is really working towards that where we have been building um, a service solution as well um, within the living lab to actually provide them with a full service system to um, really become single use plastic free, especially for the bottles and by having reusable bottles, by having uh, water filtration systems. And we actually train them to have the staff implement the systems. And in the, these pilots that we've been running there, we also have seen great success among the consumers, but also about the hotels because they can even cut costs to it and also really reduce the amount of waste they're creating massively on a daily basis. So uh, yeah, that's been exciting actually to really see that there is a, a shift in this uh, socializing of these type of solutions. Yes, I, I can add to that in terms of where we started in Bali. Now we have a network of uh, around 25 restaurants in one area. And it's, it's, it's that shift of everyone being more conscious. And then we're making it easier then for, for people to opt for these, um, this option basically, because um, as uh, I'm sure everyone listening in and everyone on this call here, uh, we're all conscious consumers and we're all aware of the mammoth issues, but then like, I'm, I'm always left with the challenge of carrying a dirty cup with me um, or I forget my cup. So it's, it's providing those solutions that could be easier for, for people to and enable them to, to be part of the solution. Thank you very much for these answers. Um, we have a third question um, that I guess would be directed to Adam and Hannah. Um, the question is, isn't it a hassle for small van owners and entrepreneurs to be handling an app? Um, did you do any trials without tech? Uh, what are your main uh, insights on that? I think maybe Adam, you can go first. Yeah, sure. I can start and then maybe Anna can add to it. <clears throat> um, I guess the way we see it is that we've built in um, advantages for the Varung owner to use to use the app. So um, as Anna mentioned, they'll, um, they're also rewarded through points by using the system. So that increases their margins. Um, also, um, you know, as you mentioned, the app allows them to manage their business. They can, um, you know, because they're recording all the sales in it, they can, um, they can see what their sales are looking like um, for a particular product versus another, another product. 
um, and you know, look back historically to see uh, you know trends, uh, you know, manage um, inventory, things like that. So, um, yeah, we've tried to make sure that uh, that in designing it, their needs were taken into consideration, and and those are the two main um, advantages to them. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, Indonesia is one of the most digitally active uh, internet uh, countries actually globally. So people are very much used to using their phone for whatever they do and whatever they purchase. So using the apples in the Warung store is quite, quite common. And I guess also it's interesting, as Adam mentioned in the beginning, that it's not a supermarket atmosphere. So it's not about really highest efficiency and being super quick in the way actually you serve your customers, but it's anyways also a bit of a um, exchange of information within the community and um, a little bit of a chit chat moment to come together. So having the kind of extra moment to also scan the mechanism, uh, to, yeah, to scan the viewing the refill mechanism, we um, have not been seeing as a challenge or at least our um, Barong owners have really not seen this as a as a downside or they were just very happy with actually the the benefits that adam just mentioned um they they could receive through this new system thank you um we have a last question for today's session before we wrap up um you mentioned some of them already in the discussion but alexandra asks uh, what do you see as the biggest drivers for reuse solutions at the moment? Um, I don't know who would like to go first. I think um, Hannah, maybe. Apologies, I, I cut off for a little bit and I missed the question. Right, the question from Alexandra is, what do you see as the biggest drivers for reuse solutions at the moment? Or, or maybe, um, Anik, you can go first. I think Hannah may have a bit of a... Yeah, I think we, we missed her, but I'm sure she's gonna join and she can just follow afterwards. I guess the biggest driver is that we've seen is that these uh, reuse solutions we see today, they really manage to use technology in a way that makes these solutions become very convenient for consumers and really overcome a lot of hassle that uh, that it otherwise would have. And I think that is really a key driver that some of them, I mean, for example, if we look at KCP, it makes it a lot more convenient than to go to a supermarket or even to go to a different supermarket to ensure that you can get all your organic produce, but instead you just get it delivered to your house. So that just makes it a lot more convenient and it just develops new way to, mode of consumption uh, that really managed to, to overcome the former hassle. And I think, that is really a convenient driver. And in a lot of cases, it even managed through setting up shorter and new supply chains to really cut on costs and uh, create more margins for all the stakeholders involved as we also see with the Bayerungs. And I guess with news, uh, maybe Hannah can take it on how this is also becoming more convenient than bringing your own Tumblr, right? Exactly, yeah. So we, we're really aiming to be the the, a solution here for for people who who want to opt for the the more sustainable option but perhaps have forgotten uh, our early adopters really are showing that that the main reason to, to use a, a new system is is because of the sustainable reasons that we want to we want to focus on those um, and the other biggest drivers um, I would say it's it's basically the businesses actually we're talking to, uh, not only the users who are demanding it, but uh, the large corporations that we're speaking to, who or the property developers who are seeing a lot of waste come um, through it, through their buildings that they have to manage, they have to pay for. So uh, providing a reusable solution and adding a tech element to it, bringing it to the tech age, is is something that is the main driver of, of our Hong Kong and Singapore markets, at least. Um, and we have tested out our, our system with a non-tech model. Uh, to answer the question before, in terms of uh, is, is using the app, uh, the solution, we actually um, have tested every, uh, all of our models uh, with a non-tech model with under the name Revolve. And now we're 
change, sorry, we're now we're changing to the new name Muse uh, because we're introducing our tech. Um, so this is really just um, an introduction for people to understand the idea. Really where we see ourselves is software licensing and, and developing the back-end tech uh, and working with larger corporations that, that perhaps have the hardware and we're providing those solutions for them. So yeah, um, from the users and from the businesses, we've seen a lot of um, demand uh, from our side and a lot of people hoping for these solutions. Well, that's actually a really, really great note to finish this Q and A on. Um, and those were a couple of really excellent questions because I think it touches upon the heart of the reuse models, how to make it uh, possible packaging wise. So how to make it technologically feasible, uh, but also in the sense of uh, desirability for, from the consumers, how do you make that work? And I'm really happy to, to have seen in these solutions now today that we actually make it more desirable for consumers. We make it more easy and more uh, convenient. And I think that's really where the future of these types of solutions lies. And um, I, I'm really grateful for having you three or you four. Actually, I think you, there are no, it's four of you. Sorry, I had to count on my screen. Uh, join join us today in this um, in this webinar. So I'm uh, unfortunately I'm about to wrap up because we're uh, we're we're uh, going uh, the time is time is running out. So I just want to end with um, uh, a summary of what we've been hearing today. Um, so I'll go back to my screen sharing. So we. We actually first, well, I've explained to you a little bit about how the Zero Waste Living Lab is actually creating the powerful examples and the solutions that show that uh, real change is possible and it's already happening. And that this impact is self-sustaining because we are building reuse business models. And the three examples that we heard were from the Zero Waste Living Lab. As I said, we're building more. Uh, so this was just, uh, these were just uh, three examples, but really great examples. Um, the first was uh, with Tancho uh, talking about how KCPR as a farm to fork model is enabling uh, circular reuse. So just uh, skipping the some use plastic, which is a key USP for customers and for farmers. Then we heard from Anna and Adam talking about how the Zero Waste Varun is a blockchain inspired um, uh, service, a uh, product service combination that actually tackles some of the key barriers uh, that traditional more analog refill systems currently face. And then we were uh, listening to Hanna from Muse who explained us how the Muse model also very tech enhanced uh, is working to enable reuse, not just uh, now in Hong Kong and Bali, but also preparing for rapid global scale up. So uh, to, to wrap up, I would like to uh, finally thank some of the partners of, and friends of our Zero Waste Living Lab program, which is run by NVU, but wouldn't be possible without the generous support of the Plastic Solution Fund, Marshall Foundation, Flotilla Foundation, and Stichting Marma. And also I would like to thank our execution and project partners um, that are listed here on the slide. Uh, without them, uh, none of this impact would have been possible. If you're interested to join our efforts or if you have ideas uh, for innovations that, that you would like to see tested in the Indonesian market, uh, don't hesitate, feel free to reach out. Um, my details are listed here, those of Anna as well. And you can also subscribe to our newsletter and you should definitely check, check out our, our Zero Waste Living Lab showcase website in which we host a lot more reuse business models that show that the real change is actually already happening. Um, and uh, that's also what Bookminster Fuller is saying, right? To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's exactly what we're doing. I would like to thank you for your um, participation and uh, listening in today. It was great to be hosting this Think Div webinar. Thank you also for the opportunity, Alan MacArthur Foundation. And now I give it back to Clemence for the final words. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Um, I hope the viewers online found this session as interesting as I did. Um, we have a lot more questions on the website that we couldn't answer in the live, but. Uh, don't worry about it. The, the, everyone here in the session uh, will uh, be able to go to the web, 
uh, web page and answer these questions. Um, keep sending them in. Uh, keep you know interacting with with us. Uh, we have a lot more sessions coming up all through the week at the diff. Um, I want to thank you, Sandrine, for facilitating the session. I know it isn't a very uh, uh, easy job to do, and uh, I think the session was really, really interesting. Thank you, Anna, for helping organizing it. And of course, thank you, Hannah, Tantio, and, and Adam for uh, talking to us about your projects uh, and answering all questions. Um, so yeah, you, you can learn more about any of you um, on the session page in the comment box. We've uh, also put the link to their website as well as all of the three projects we discussed today. Um, and you can catch up on anything you missed uh, and find the full diff schedule at thinkdiff.co. Thank you very much.